Julius Caesar belonged to a renowned family, but a far from wealthy one. He borrowed huge sums to get the leg up that his political career needed, but then he needed to solve that. The answer was Gaul. By the time that war was finished, Caesar was powerful, wealthy, and in prime position in Rome. Now think about Antonius, a relative of Caesar's, who had been profligate in his youth, and indeed throughout his life. Antonius, by 58 BC, had run up enormous debts. In the hope of solving this, he secured positions with Caesar several times during the Gallic Wars, but not until 54, and even then only sporadically. While Caesar gained the profit from eight years of war, Antonius secured two or three at most, and as a secondary officer, not the campaign's master. Perhaps he paid off his debts entirely, perhaps not. Even if he did, if he wanted to go on living a lavish lifestyle, and all indications are that lavish, even extravagant, was Antonius's natural state, then he would need more money. A lot more. Helping Caesar in several years of civil war would not solve that. Profit could not be made out of fellow Romans like it could from foreigners, and over the ensuing years, Antonius is repeatedly shuffled into political roles in Rome by Caesar, honourable and significant, but far from lucrative. Then, in 44, Antonius is granted the consulship alongside Caesar. In this era, both consuls could command armies and campaign, but with Caesar now long-term dictator, with authority even over the consuls, it seems highly unlikely Antonius would be permitted to campaign anywhere while Caesar is in the east. Antonius has now been left to keep Rome settled several times, and it seems highly likely that this is simply the next of those duties. So Caesar is marching east to crush the Parthian Empire, notably the richest potential enemy of Rome. If the campaign is successful, Caesar and his officers and men will accrue incredible wealth. Antonius, sitting in Rome, will not. Indeed, he will spend it. Moreover, though he is now consul, he is still outranked even in Rome, for Caesar plans to leave Lepidus in the city as his magister equium, the dictator's second in command. There is one event yet to consider in this particular discussion— Marcus Antonius knew there was a plot against Caesar, and knew that, at the very least, Trebonius was part of it. The name of Cassius would also almost certainly have leapt to his lips as a potential plotter. After the incident with Spurina, they had a terminus antiquem for Caesar's death, March 15th. Antonius knew that Caesar was fated to die by the Ides of March, on that faithful day, when any Roman, for all Romans were believers, had to know that Caesar's death was imminent, Antonius accompanies Caesar to the Senate meeting. Appian, in his Civil Wars II, 117, tells us, the conspirators had left Trebonius, one of their number, to engage Antony in conversation at the door. So, on a day that Antonius knew Caesar was fated to die, he allowed himself to be waylaid at the door by the one man that he knew beyond all doubt had been part of a plot to kill Caesar. The implications of this are simply staggering, and they cast Antonius in a new and rather unflattering light. He may not have been involved in the conspiracy to murder Caesar, but he clearly let it happen, by withholding his knowledge of it at least, and by allowing Trebonius to waylay him at the Senate steps. I have many villains in the book. There are the violent gangs, there are the assassins planning to kill Caesar, but most of all, I have the man who Caesar trusted, and who can only have let the murder happen. History paints Marcus Junius Brutus as the greatest deceiver and villain of the tale, but he was far from alone in that. Antonius is my real villain. To the Causes History tells us that three events turned Rome against Caesar and led to what happened. 
The first was the fact that when Caesar received honours from the Senate at the Temple of Venus, he remained seated, an insult that was noted by all. The reason for this has been explained differently by sources. Some say he was advised to stay seated, others that he was ill. I have chosen to make it part of the ongoing illness that is part of Caesar's great legacy. More on the illness to follow. One thing I chose to avoid in this scene was relating Cassius Dio's version of the reason. Some who subsequently tried to defend him claimed, it is true, that owing to an attack of diarrhoea he could not control the movement of his bowels, and so had remained where he was in order to avoid a flux. The second such cause is a sort of mishmash of two events, one being the calling of Caesar as Rex, the failed joke and the arrests, the other being the crown placed on Caesar's statue. The reasons for these events are still debated now, but given Caesar's mind, it seems impossible to believe that it was anything other than a deliberate attempt to be offered a crown and to turn it down, especially given that the third straw that broke the camel's back was that moment at Lupercalia. Antonius tried twice to push a crown on Caesar, who refused, thrilling the public, though no one who knew him at all could have been under any illusion as to what they were seeing. This is so clearly a set-up moment. Caesar's will plays less of a part in the story than it might have done, incidentally, and is one of the most fascinating angles of the whole period. However, the actual importance of Caesar's will only becomes apparent after his death, naturally, when Octavian attempts to secure legitimacy. Thus, I have largely ignored its importance, alluded to it in a number of scenes, and only really dealing with it, as at the end, in passing. A word next about superstition. All Romans believed in the gods, and all Romans were superstitious to some extent, but sources suggest that Caesar was less so than most, for even having been given a terminal date and with disastrous dreams, knowing there were plots against him, he went on in a blasé fashion, as though nothing had changed. The Haruspex Spurina, only mentioned in one source and otherwise unattested in the whole of history, had set the Ides of March as Caesar's final potential day. Yet Caesar went on with Senate meetings, still planning his coming campaign. At some point on that final day, he was at the house of Calvinus, where he met Spurina again. Valerius Maximus gives us this tale. This seems to have been the moment, though another source has it confusingly at the portico of Pompey, when Caesar famously tells the man, The Ides have come and I am still alive, while Spurina replies that, they might have come, but they have not yet gone. Sources have Marcus Junius Brutus being the man who persuaded Caesar to attend the Senate session, and yes, one of my greatest challenges in this series has been keeping the two Brutuses separate. History tells us that sixty men were involved in the conspiracy against Caesar, although he was stabbed only twenty-three times, and despite this we only have certain names. I have left the blame chiefly with certain of them. The conspirators we know about that are detailed in this book. Marcus Junius Brutus, Gaius Cassius Longinus, Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus, Gaius Trebonius, Lucius Tilius Kimber, Publius Servilius Casca Longus, Servius Sulpicius Galba, Pontius Aquila. Others not taking part, Quintus Ligarius, Lucius Minucius Basilus, Gaius Cassius Parmensis, Caecilius, Busilianus, Rubrius Ruga, Marcus Spurius, Publius Sextius Naso, Petronius, Publius Cerilius, Pacuvius Labeo, Servilius Casca. Four men from this novel are conspicuously missing from the list. Cicero is even now considered a shady character in this respect, and there are people who suspect him of being the driving force behind the whole affair, despite that he later expressed regret he was not one of the assassins. Secondly, Antonius. I think I've covered that well enough. 
at the least he was an enabler of the plot. The third one is Salvius, who appears rather obliquely here in that Antonius's gang imprison Galronus and Salvius in his cousin's house with the keys. Though no Salvius appears among the lists of the killers, it is interesting that a Salvius was the very first man to be executed by Antonius's party in the proscriptions following Caesar's death. If he was not involved in the assassination as one of the unrecorded sixty, and Antonius was what I have intimated, then that reeks heavily of a villain covering his tracks. Interesting, no? The last is Fronto, who I think I have now explained sufficiently. Fronto must put a blade in Caesar to fulfil his vow to Virginius, but he is a man loyal to Caesar, and so, being the one who administers the coup de grace and saves Caesar his agony seems appropriate, and anyone who's been eagle-eyed since Book One will have noted something. When the cavalry officer Longinus died in Book One, Fronto visited his villa near Taraco in Spain. In Book Nine, Fronto was back there again, following the episode with Virginius. He then bought the villa, and placed a freedman, Arius Rustius, in control, transferring the deeds to him. In the aftermath of the death of Caesar, Fronto tells Antonius that the Falerii are gone forever, and not to look for him again. He returns to the villa and takes on the name of the Rustii. Anyone who has read wider in my books will have then perhaps picked up a certain Praetorian by the name of Gnaeus Marcius Rustius Rufinus, of a troubled family who live in a coastal village near Taraco. So yes, Fronto's family goes on, and two centuries later you can read about his descendant in the Praetorian books, but the change of name might explain why Fronto does not appear in the lists. On the assassination itself, all four main sources are fairly succinct and generally agree, though there are differences in the details. That there were sixty conspirators, and that Caesar was stabbed twenty-three times, we can be content. I have tried to present the best average portrayal, given that Fronto does not actually witness the murder, so some of the detail is therefore irrelevant. Both Plutarch and Appian tell us Caesar planned to send Antonius to dismiss the Senate. Suetonius tells us that it was approaching lunchtime when Caesar, persuaded by Decimus Brutus, attended the Senate meeting. Dio instead tells us that it was dawn and has Trebonius being the one pulling Antonius aside at the steps. Appian similarly names Trebonius in this role. Plutarch, in contradiction, has it being Decimus Brutus that stops Antonius outside the Curia. For the record, I have selected Trebonius as the delayer, since he is cited twice and Brutus only once, and I have had the event later in the day as per Suetonius, for the morning routine for senators would usually call for their salutatio in the morning, and so a later meeting seems likely. Suetonius has the episode with Caesar and Spurina that the day had come as they enter the Senate house, though I have discarded this, since there would be no reason for a haruspex to be there. Dio also relates the exchange, but with no other details than that it was on the day of the killing. Similarly, Plutarch tells us that the exchange took place on the way to the Senate. Suetonius has Caesar seated and Kimber striking the first blow, then Casca, Caesar fighting back and stabbing his attacker in the arm with a stylus. Plutarch echoes this depiction, though he has Caesar and Kimber locked in a struggle over the knife after the first blow is delivered. Appian too has Caesar seated, though he has Kimber initiating the attack, but Casca striking the first blow. Suetonius tells us that he was stabbed twenty-three times, and gives the immortal et tu brute line when Marcus Brutus takes his turn. He says that only the second wound to the chest was a mortal one. Dio only tells us that they gathered around Caesar and tried to allay his suspicions, then attacked him en masse. He also tells the et tu brute tale, although he does not tell us which Brutus it was. 
Plutarch has Brutus delivering a blow to the groin, one of the noted killing zones. It is Plutarch who tells us that Caesar collapsed at the feet of the statue of Pompey. Appian also tells us this, having Brutus delivering the blow that sends him staggering thus. Incidentally, there is a tale told across the sources about one Artemidorus of Cnidos, who came from the house of Brutus that morning with full details and proof of the plot, which reached Caesar but was never read. Suetonius does not mention him by name, yet has the document put in Caesar's hand but unread. Dio tells us he was given the message but did not read it. Plutarch gives us much detail of this episode, including the name, though the result is still the same, in hand and unread. Appian gives us a rather garbled version, separating the unread document and the message of Artemidoros into two events. This whole thing would have added nothing to my account, and so I have not included it in the text. The upshot is that I was never going to have Fronto as one of the assassins, and so he had to be on Caesar's side, yet he could not prevent the killing without changing history and so I had to have him too late to do anything about it, which necessitated not actually portraying the assassination itself. I am, however, becoming adept at describing deaths in retrospective, as anyone who's read my Caligula will know. Finally, a word on Caesar's illness. That he was struck by these attacks is historically attested, and it would certainly have been kept quiet, for Rome was superstitious, and no one would want to be thought cursed. For a long time it has been assumed that it was epilepsy that Caesar suffered, although more recently scientists are more inclined to blame a series of mini-strokes. The former is a condition that can be managed and changes little over time. The latter is indicative of failing health, and would likely gradually become worse and more debilitating. Thus I have suggested that Caesar was in decline at the end, and even had Antonius use that as an excuse. So, there you have it. Fronto's adventures with Caesar are over, and though I am regularly asked if I will continue the series, I am afraid the answer is no. Marius's Mules has always been envisaged as an arc of fifteen books, ending on the Ides of March, 44 BC. You can follow his distant descendant in the Praetorian series. It may be that one day I yearn again for the late Republic, and if I do, there are two young men ready to carry the torch into the Augustan age, but for now that is not in my plans. There are simply too many other tales waiting to be told. But I'm hoping you have enjoyed living Fronto's adventures with him. I hope you are pleased with this final outing, and I ask you to raise a glass to his memory when next you can. I know I shall. See you soon, with a whole new series. Vale. Simon Turney. February 2023. You've been listening to Marius's Mules 15, The Ides of March, by S.J.A. Turney. Narrated by Malk Williams. Published by Quest Audiobooks, an imprint of W.F. Howes Limited. This recording is copyrighted by W.F. Howes Limited.